Hello everyone, welcome to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak, and today we are going over episode 24 of season 5 of the TV show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, the episode The Main Attraction. And there's a lot of wonderful things that we're going to get to discuss in today's episode, not only in overviewing the season thus far, and noting that the consistent theme has always been understanding what it means to have a relationship with God, but also understanding the obstacles that we can sometimes allow into our hearts and lives and understanding what that relationship is all about and understanding God's character and why we can not only relate to him based off of the efforts he's made to reach out to us, but even more so and more importantly that why I'm fully in support of why they saved the best for last and noting that sometimes these obstacles need to be considered and these points about God's heart need to be brought up repeatedly because they just are that important. Now, today's episode, today's themes, are not only one of many examples that I would point to as fine illustrations of not only God's character and heart, but the reason why I love My Little Pony is the TV show that it is, not because of the Technicolor horses and the magic of friendship. No, the reason why I call myself a brony and why I watch the show is because it constantly, repeatedly, and clearly brings me back to God's Word and the nature and heart of Jesus Christ. That's why I watch the show. Not for the <laughs> equines, but for the messages that they represent, the Word that they bring me back to, and the God that they help me commune with all the more. I'm not wasting my time in this, and I hope not to of yours either, which is why I'm going to stop talking and go straight to God's Word. Today, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14, and I want to tell you guys about a very significant event and topic that Paul the Apostle addressed when discussing a very important issue in referring to understanding God and their relationship with Him properly in regards to the New and Old Testament, which I'm sure is a question that's come up in your hearts as well. Because too many people see the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament and saying, are those two different gods? I mean, I see wrath and judgment here, and I see love and mercy here. Well, for those who see love and mercy in the New Testament, you haven't seen or read the book of Revelation, or most of the epistles, or any of the Gospels. So pretty much you haven't read the New Testament. And if you only see a God of judgment and wrath in the Old Testament, you haven't read the book of Hosea, or Habakkuk, or the Psalms, or the Torah, or the Pentateuch, or pretty much you haven't read the Bible, if that's what you think God is like. You've just adapted to what people have told you about God, and that's what we're going to be addressing today. Understanding the difference between what people say about a celebrity and actually knowing someone, and being able to form proper conclusions about their character. 2 Corinthians 3.14 But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, before we get into this passage, I want to actually ask you guys to turn to the what this passage is actually talking about, because this passage started with a but, and this is implying that something was actually being discussed before as far as the themes, and this is referring to the Jews and the people who have read and had a relationship with God through the Old Covenant but have rejected Jesus in failing to understand what the Old Testament was there and meant to serve as, in which I'd like to turn to the book of Exodus. All the way back to the beginning, even the Orthodox Jews recognize this book as divinely inspired, in which I want to point you out, or point out to you, rather, what Paul was pointing out to the church in Corinth as to what this veil was referring to. Exodus 34 and verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain. Context, 
Moses, after the golden calf incident, you remember he smashed the stone tablets. Because honestly, let's look at the Ten Commandments and say, Okay, what sins aren't you breaking right now? You're definitely not honoring God. and that No, that's not honoring your mother either. And don't... Oh, jeez. Um, oh, oh, Levi, that's not your wife. Uh, no, that doesn't belong... And then he's just basically like, What's the point of this if they're not going to follow it? And he smashed it. Also, in a good deal of anger as well but that's when we get into the book of exodus we'll go into more details about where moses was mentally at the time of this and why you can honestly understand why he flipped out but he came down with new autographed tablets from god about the ten commandments and a reiterated message of what he'd be writing in the first five books of the bible the messages that he gave in deuteronomy the law he laid down in leviticus the history recorded in leviticus the story that was then forth being written in the book of Exodus and the book of Genesis itself where God dictated to him world history leading up to this current time that they were in. But when he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. That's an interesting detail to overlook. Verse 30, So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, And then when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, meaning a translucent and see-through piece of cloth, much like a certain countess was wearing. And I want you to keep that in mind. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and would come out and speak to the children of Israel whenever and whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him, referring to the Lord. So with these two contexts in mind, let's go back to the first passage in that there is a veil and a similar piece of information that's obscuring vision and blocking understanding. When people read the Old Testament without coming to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And why is that? Well, noting that Paul here is addressing this veil that Ra-Ra similarly and symbolically was addressing and representing in today's episode was for the same principle and representing the same fact that those who read the Old Testament and God's actions therein, because essentially here's the Bible in seven seconds. The Old Testament is what God did. The New Testament, or the Gospels, is what God, or who God is, and the epistles are what to do with this information. There you go. But also noting that these very simple facts about God's nature and sometimes the most criticized events of world history that have been proven call into question God's character as saying, well, Old Testament I see judgment and wrath, New Testament I see love and mercy, which is it? Well, if I know God is a God of love and mercy by personally meeting him in the person of Jesus Christ, that God actually showed up and became a part of our lives, then I can look at what he did and say, oh, maybe the news website that told me that he, for all intents and purposes, could care less about those people was because he wasn't even there at the time, and that if he was there, he would have actually cared absolutely. Much like all of us are willing to demonize or idolize celebrities, even though having no information about them, you'd understand that the people who know them on a personal level have a very different perspective as to what the common knowledge is about people, and especially about an individual so important and vital to our lives as God himself, in which I want to address through the two symbolized understandings of people's heart, through Pinkie Pie and through Applejack, and how they related to a certain countess. Now, Pinkie Pie didn't know Rara. She knew the countess. She knew what everyone told her she was, the number one, more than Sapphire Shores, mind you, the number one celebrity and pop diva in all of Equestria. But also taking into account that her high-maintenance needs, as affirmed and brushed over by Rarity, and her 
very stingy and stringent schedule that implied that Pinkie Pie had to jump through so many hoops, and a lot of hoops to jump through at that, quoting her directly. They assumed that this was natural of a celebrity, in which we get our second example, someone who actually knew the Countess before she put on that veil, Ra-Ra. Applejack knew the Ra-Ra from Friendship Camp. She knew her before the manager stepped in and the actual jerk and in influence in her life had begun to take power. Applejack emphasized and really revealed her heart and integrity to people who wouldn't really care to look much further than the lights and dazzle and show and smoke and mirrors. Applejack got her to take off that veil and sing with the voice that she was born with, not what technology had altered it into. And not only that, but also to understand, as directly relating to the people of Israel and the church in Corinth themselves, not only who she was being misrepresented as, but who was using her name and deceiving her. And we've talked about in previous episodes, like Princess Spike, about false prophets, which comes again into play here. And if you want to discuss more about those topics, I encourage you to listen to the study. But, noting that this was a prevalent and ongoing issue in church history and world history, those who use the names of powerful people and misrepresent their heart and character, and thus not only giving them a bad name, but almost taking their name, putting it on them and saying, I'm God. Someone who represents God and misuses that privilege, there is not one example in Scripture where God takes that very personally. And in this, again, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul addresses the issues of people much like the countess's manager who are using God's name to get their needs met and also allowing a veil to be put over their own faces and not recognizing the reality that they were being used, in which Paul says something very interesting. I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. I don't want to share you, especially with a jerk like that. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel in which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, the twelve, I'm not more or less greater than any of them. But guess what? Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. You know what we talked about? You know that I don't pull punches on my doctrine or in my facts and reality. And you tell me if they're not only hiding details from you, but I just want you to, as Applejack said, give them a little test. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted? because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself as the truth of Christ is in me, No one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. Paul was saying, I ministered to you as an effort of charity. I accepted donations from other churches so that I could support myself to bring the gospel to you free of charge. Now whose heart does that sound like? Sounds like the real rah-rah that Applejack grew up knew and loved, right? But then there's also the alternative side of this truth. But what I do, I will also continue to do. I'm not cutting off charities. I'm not spending less time with the school fillies so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast, for such are false apostles. 
deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, his servants, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They put on the suit and the collar and they say, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and to give you everything that you need. And if you're sick, brother, then that means you have a lack of faith. Donate to my ministry and we will send our prayers to you and I'll send you this special prayer rug that's a section off of what I've actually bled and shown tears into in just the grievances of how I just so longingly need your desperate donation because, you know, God's going bankrupt and if you don't send in your donation, we're going to have to close down and I'll have to move in, out of my third house. And it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Their father is a liar and so they are no strangers to fraud. But here's the thing whose end will be according to their works. Where Satan's going, they will lead. And just like Rarity's manager's personality caught up to him when it was exposed to the light, what happened then when we bring this all together and understand that the Israelites and the Corinthians and the understanding of the Old Testament and God got a rude wake-up call when they realized all this time that they were following the wrong God they knew and had a relationship with a manager, with a lord, and not a king and a father. Understand the difference. That it's not only understanding that we have the same enemy, but that our enemy isn't outside of ourselves. It's our own pride and unwillingness to recognize who's the real threat. Because the only one who was keeping Ra Ra from seeing what a jerk her manager was was Rara, was the countess, and recognize the difference, what the manager was making her into, the reflection of the glory that was in his heart. The only thing that the manager had to praise her for was the lights, the shows, the auto-tuned, the artificial talent and control of vocalization, the light shows and the artificial presentation and just the absolute big show and it wouldn't be a show without those things. And most of all, the self-profiting nature that only focuses on ministering to themselves, even to the neglect of others. But then let's take that information and apply it to the real rah-rah we knew. Who is Countess? I'm sorry, I can't pronounce her name. <laughs> I mean, the episode, I only see it twice thus far in the day that it's been released. You can give me a break, but Ra Ra is much easier. I agree with Applejack on that. Maybe I have more with her than common. Maybe that's why she's best pony. Mm. But what was the difference between the Countess, auto-tuned, light shows, and self-publicizing? Whereas when Ra Ra just simply sat down on a piano and sung the same song that got her her cutie mark, it was not only talented, not artificial, not auto-tuned, but talented. A gift from God. But it was beautiful. All in its own simplicity. And noting that without the light shows and the big dramatic choreography and all the other six guys that, for all intents and purposes, let's be honest, the manager was probably spending more time looking at than the actual singer and actress. Take from that what you will. It was beautiful. It was talented. And most of all, it was focused on those who were closest to her heart, those who were around her, those who loved her, and those that she loved as well. And knowing that's the only commandment that's ever been worth following, understand that this was all a reflection of who they were. And not only that, but also a reflection of who they were following, who they were serving. Craig Groeschel actually pointed it out in his book, The Alter Ego, laying your pride down on the altar as a sacrifice and saying, you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And that's a good quote because understand the reality of all of this. The veil that was being illustrated, that was consistently being kept over Ra Ra's eyes and maintaining her identity as the Countess was only keeping her from those he loved, only keeping her from those she loved. But also noting that this veil also kept her from recognizing who her enemies really were. 
How then does this apply to our relationship with God? If I relate to God and I look at the Acts of the Old Testament and I see a God of judgment and of wrath, even in the times where he says, I, how could I give up on you? I remove heaven and earth for you. I give up my life for you and physically fulfilled it in the life of Jesus. And you say, well, I guess he's God. You know, I mean, look at all the other pagan gods. I mean, uh, they were basically just self-serving sociopaths. So I guess that's just the kind of God that God is. I mean, we just worship him. So all this other stuff, it's all about me. So I'm following these other gods. But then the Christian says, no, how did God reveal himself to us? He said, at the expense of everything I had, though that made no sense to anyone else in history, I loved you for you. You had nothing to offer me. And I chose you. I gained nothing by loving you and yet chose to do so anyway. The veil that is generally worn by individuals is a translucent and reflective piece of cloth that not only covers the major details of someone's face normally during times of grieving but in any given fashion statement and sense much like we saw with the countess this veil kept her from seeing who her enemies really were but it also kept her from seeing who her only true ally really was and that's what i want to talk to you and conclude with you in today's message when the countess was following her manager it was fake it was artificial and it was selfish when Ra Ra simply sang for those that she loved it was not only beautiful and from the heart but touched the hearts and lives of those who even were listening to her on a TV screen perhaps even those who heard her a week in advance on Equestria Daily but note these things as all understanding that we have a veil over our own eyes and it's called our pride are we willing to recognize that we might be wrong in how we relate to and understand God and say, all right, God, who do you say that you are so that I can get to know you from there? Can you remove the veil by coming to you? And understanding that we don't serve a Lord who only loves those who are useful to him, but a father who gave his life up for his children. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you follow. Because you need to understand that there is a liar out there. And he knows how to make himself look and sound good and give you everything you thought you wanted. But in reality, who is the only one who lets you not only see how beautiful you really are, but also gave you that value himself by allowing you to bear a reflection of the very light and glory that shone from Moses' face, if by no other means than simply interacting with him, being with him, and knowing how much he loved him. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you'd like to ask questions about the topics discussed in this message, leave them in the comments below. If you would like to encourage the ministry, leave a like and subscribe as you feel called. It's great encouragement, but most importantly, if you know someone who perhaps doesn't know God, it's the God who he actually is, who calls God Lord instead of Daddy like he asked us to. Please share the study with anyone you feel not only needs to hear it, but would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time in listening to the study. And once again, remember, Jesus loves you.